so good morning, everyone. My name is David Grealish, and I am a computer historian. Granted myself that title. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here to talk to you this morning. And uh, I think you're going to enjoy my presentation. Um, we're going to learn something and uh, maybe have some fun. Um, so it's entitled The Great Moments on Film and Computer History. So notice I'm not saying the greatest moments necessarily, but great moments. Um, but it's sort of a mixed presentation here. Whoops, so I got to change it over here. So first, just to tell you a little bit more about me, is uh, this is my website. It's classiccomputing.com. So if you get an opportunity, check it out. Um, this is the front loading page. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my book called Classic Computing here. It's totally free as a PDF ebook for download. Um, I have two main podcasts that I do currently, The History of Personal Computing and Stan Beat's History of Personal Computing. That's an audio book. Um, and also, there was an About Me. If you go to my About Me page, I have you know some different articles I've written over the years. Uh, mostly about computer history, and then also some, some interviews that I think are really good and I'm, I'm particularly proud of, like um, Ed Roberts, one of the first ones I ever did way back in 1995. He's a creator of the Altair computer that started the whole personal computer revolution. Uh, Alan Kay, John Scully, the guy that fired Steve Jobs, and uh, a few other people. So, uh, and then more about some of my podcasts and the other ones that I don't do anymore. So a little bit more about me is this is uh, the first computer, personal computer I ever used, an Apple II. I didn't own one. It was at college in Jacksonville, Florida, where I'm from. First personal computer I ever owned, Commodore 64, that a really nice girlfriend gave me in 1986, rather late in its, its you know, run or whatever. All I ever owned was just the computer. So all I could ever really do was plug it into my TV, leave it on for days at a time, and just mess around in basic. So kind of like I was poor. So what I really consider my first real true computer came in very late December, just for the New Year's of 1989, and it was an Apple Lisa. And um, the Apple Lisa, my Apple Lisa was a new old stock Apple Lisa and, uh, from a company that was called Sun Remarketing out of Utah, and it was a Mac Plus for all practical purposes. It, was, it was, ran Macintosh software. Um, and this actually played the part of being kind of the first catalyst as to me getting into computer history. I was so fascinated by this that it, it, it got me interested in its history, then Apple's history. Excuse me, um, the two Steves, and then you know from there, computer history in general. This is a program that was actually aired in Canada, and it's called Bits and Bytes from TV Ontario, 1983. I didn't discover this until I joined the Army. Um, but this is also what I'm calling one of the other catalysts of my, history, my interest in computer history. This is the intro. Has anyone ever heard of this program? You can watch it on YouTube. It's great. It's a great time capsule. 1983. So, of course, it was talking about new technology in 1983, but now it's awesome. Look back. People from Canada should maybe recognize this. Hello. Welcome to Bits and Bytes. Really great, though. Again, it's all on uh, YouTube. Here's some of the books that were really instrumental in my, my interest. And uh, highly recommend Hackers by Stephen Levy. Uh, most of these you can find used easily. But uh, Fire in the Valley has been redone over the years. Uh, these two, bit, bit by Bit and Digital Deli, again, pretty easy to get, but they, you know, they're out of print. And then one other program, here's its intro. I'll just see if anybody's ever seen this before. Uh, 1992 on PBS. My favorite all-time documentary about computer history. Anybody? It's, it's, on, it's on the internet. It's uh, five parts, I think. So it's like five hours all together. I haven't watched it in a little while. Um, great thing about history is it doesn't change. Same though this is 1992, still good history. It's still a great program to watch. Again, it's all it's out there. You can check it out. So um, I uh, so I joined the army. Um, 
And so this is a picture of 1992. I was in the Army. I got married. Um, I was really interested in computer history. Um, so I decided that I was about to come back to the States uh, from Germany. I decided, you know what? When I get back to the States, I think I'm going to start collecting computers. That's pretty interesting. I think that would be a fun thing to do. So I, this is me in El Paso, Texas. And I started collecting old computers. And I started a, a uh, society called the Historical Computing Society, Computer Society. And then I started a newsletter. So here's some more pictures of me a <coughs> long time ago. But I started a newsletter, and this is the first one, August 1993, called Historically Brewed, a play on the word like home brewed, the home brewed computer club and all that. Most outside people didn't get it at all. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily a great name. But here's the first issue. I ended up doing nine issues up until about 1997. Then I had kids, and things got complicated, and I kind of stopped. Um, in, that, in that last issue, that's where I interviewed Ed Roberts. I had transcribed my audio interview. And later, after he died, that's when I, I got to, made it digital and put it up where you listen to it. So anyway, some time went by. I trickily got back into computer history. I mean, I never left enjoying old computers, computer history. But then I finally started like started my a web page and started to do some podcasting and some other stuff. But I decided in 2011 to take all my newsletters and zines they were called, and I put them all together in a book. And I, I put my story at the beginning, and it's called I called it the Complete Historically Brewed, and it was sold through a Kickstarter campaign. Um, and also, I had made this first issue, Classic Computing Number One, in about 97, 98. And I spent most of the money getting these color covers done, and it never saw the, the light of day, but I saved all the covers. So with the Kickstarter campaign, I actually finally completed and printed this issue. So it was the book and issue number one. In any case, later on, I revised the book and finally got smart and just called the book Classic Computing, a lot better name, The Complete Historically Brewed. And this book contains all nine issues, my story, and that Classic Computing uh, number one. Um, sold all the physical copies like 400 or so over the years, not bad. But now it exists as a PDF ebook, and it's totally free from my site. You can download it. So I, I like to call it the history of computer history nostalgia. This is where I'm so now some video clips. Time and oh, I shouldn't have done that. I, I guess I could just. This is where I'm I might spend most of his time. So I'm going to go right into some of the different video the clips. Century. This equipment here will allow him to carry on normal business activities without ever going to an office away from home. This is actually a promotional look this at the future from Philco, which is an early radio television manufacturer. This is 1967. And you'll see some of this they got right. Now to get a newspaper copy for permanent reference. So I you look at your newspaper digitally, button. but now you would print your newspaper. <laughs> and out it comes. When I've finished catching up on the news, I might uh, check the latest weather. This same screen can give me the latest report on the stocks I might own. A telephone is this instrument here, a mock-up of a possible future telephone. This would be the mouthpiece. Now, if I want to see the people I'm talking with, so it's I just funny though that they the have that concept of a different terminal for different there things. There they are. Versus one, you know, general purpose. Over here, as I work on this screen, I can keep in touch with other rooms of the house through a closed circuit television system. <laughs> with equipment Hurry up like with that this, bad the of the future, <laughs> we may not have to go to work. The work would come to us. In the 21st century, it may be that no home will be complete without a computerized communications console. It's Controls not. a full array of equipment to inform, instruct, and entertain the family of the future. The possibilities for the evening's program are called up on this screen. We could uh, watch a football game or a movie shown in full color on our big 3D television screen. The sound would come from these globe-like speakers. Or with Isn't it funny they made it like a control panel, like it's a studio in your house versus from just... our 21st century lives and fill the room with stereophonic music from another age. But a lot of the foundational things of our reality is, is here. 1967, what Everything showing. in this home of the future has been designed for comfort. 
Today's air conditioners, for instance, are only the beginning. The home of the 21st century might have a completely controlled environment. For example, those wall panels can change themselves to darken a room or let in more light. They're controlled by this switchboard. And we have those LED windows now. AT&T had a series of commercials. Have you ever borrowed a book from thousands of miles away? Okay. Across the country. Just your hand. 1993, AT&T. for directions. They get a lot of things right. Or send wrong. someone a fax. <laughs> Imagine a world and this where is from every word ever written, special. every picture ever painted, and every film ever shot could be viewed instantly in your home via an information superhighway, a high-capacity digital communications network. What that would mean is you could transform your home into a mammoth interactive entertainment centre with the odd stock exchange and shopping centre thrown in. It sounds pretty grand, but it all comes down to computers communicating. And in fact, that's already happening on something called the Internet, that anyone in the world with a computer and a modem to connect it to a telephone line can subscribe to. There are over 20 million people connected up, and one person in particular I know is connected is the American President Bill Clinton. Right. And I know that because <laughs> I used this computer to write to him today, and I've already got a reply from the White House. And I bet. Here it is, right. program, and some pictures <laughs> as well. It's all good fun, but what limits the potential of all this is that it's relatively slow. You can't play a video down this, and in fact, most of that stuff we've had to receive in advance. That's because copper telephone lines are really designed for people to talk down, not for computers. But with an information superhighway built with high-capacity fibre-optic cables, you're not limited to shifting around text and the odd picture. You can send high-quality sound and video as well. So when are we going to get all this then? <laughs> At the moment, regulations restrict what services can be offered by phone companies, cable television operators, and so on. But in America, for any company who's prepared to invest in an information superhighway, there's a new law, which means they can transmit anything they like on it. Video, music, telephones, data, the lot. As long as they let other people provide services on it too. But it's not just a license to print money. The companies will also be compelled to connect every classroom and library free of charge. So society stands to benefit as well. 22 years ago, so a lot of stuff's changed since then. So before we get to some other uh, video clips, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some general computer history. That should be fun, right? There's generally four generations. The first one, the first generation, is usually defined by vacuum tubes. And on the left here is the ENIAC from 1946. It was built for the war effort, not completed to after the war effort. Still considered a huge success. Um, so the, the two pictures on the, the left are part of, part of the ENIAC, which took up a huge room. It had about 18,000 vacuum tubes. And when it was in operation, one would burn out about every 30 seconds. But they were smart to build them into these panels, so in troubleshooting, you could simply grab a panel out, plug in a new one, then worry about the particular vacuum tube later to, you know, to fix. On the right is uh, the Univac one from 1951. It's generally considered the first, com the first commercially available computer. Um, at the time, in the 50s, early 50s, Univac was synonymous with computer. So people referred to them like Scotch tape, you know, as instead of computers, Univac. So with the second generation, what uh, really heralded that in was uh, the transistor. Uh, so again, the same basic type of switch, uh, digital binary switch like a vacuum tube. So this is a reproduction of what the first uh, working transistor was, 1947. And it was invented by John Bardeen, Walter Bretain, and then William Shockley. Uh, and here's some examples of different transistor packages on the bottom right. Upper right is generally considered the first fully all transistorized computer slash calculator. Had about 3,000 of them. That's the IBM 608 from 1957. And even in showing this picture, that is like the main computer part of the installation because computers back then weren't just like, here's the computer. You know, it was like a whole 
package installation thing. So that is way smaller than you know the Univac and the ENIAC, but there's still more to it than that. It still took up a room to, you know, to support it and use it and so on. I always love this picture. Um, I, I'm trying to think, I have this down. What, I know that is from like a Cray or something, or a CDC from the Computer History Museum. So not really as old as I'm trying to talk about here. But something interesting happened with transistors before um, the next step, the next generation was, in theory, there was no limit to a computer you could design, especially because transistors solved a lot of problems about heat and size. But it didn't solve one critical problem, that was human wiring of transistors together. So even though in theory you could create massive computers, there was a human limitation of how many you could like wire together and sort of keep up with. And it was kind of referred to as a rat's nest or the, tyr sorry, the tyranny of numbers sort of put a, a limit on what you could do. So what happened was really the third generation of computing came in. And on the bottom left here, this is actually what's called a, uh, a VLSI, which is very large scale integration versus just LSI earlier in that, but the integrated circuit. So I believe that one, do I have it on here? I think that one's like 5,000 transistors or, or 10,000. Uh, the upper right is an early uh, computer that's transistorized, the, the DEC PDP-8, 1965. Uh, that's a slightly later one, though. The bottom right is a Data General Nova 3, 1975. So uh, computers are getting way smaller, right? Because a heat problem solved, a tyranny of numbers is solved. So that brings us to the fourth generation, which we're still all in. And um, people tend to think that it was just logical that computers, and it was for the most part, but that computers just got smaller, faster, cheaper. And, and they did to a certain extent, and, but that brought us to this, to personal computing. But that's not really what happened. Um, you know, personal computers are not really a, a logical evolution of mainframes and minis and stuff because they have something none of those have, and that's a microprocessor. And the microprocessor is what generated the evolution, you know, revolution that we live in with personal computing. Um, the upper right is the 8080. So that was in the Altair and the MSI and a lot of the other early micros. And then you have the MOS 6502, obviously very famous in the, I don't got to tell you guys, <laughs> Commodore, Apple, so on, Atari. Uh, down here is a uh, RCA 1802, another important uh, you know, early 8-bit chip. And then over here is the, I, I probably should add a 6800 Motorola, so I think I'll do that next time. Um, and then the 8088, which is the 16-bit processor of the IBM PC, which uh, like it or don't like it, obviously a huge part of the computer, personal computer revolution, right? The IBM clones. So here's a cover, uh, you know, a picture of the cover, the first, the, uh, the cover of January 1975, Popular Electronics, which to Altair, which basically kicked off the personal computer revolution. Uh, that was a mock-up, so it didn't look like that. That's what it looked like, the upper one, and that's a later Altair. This picture here is actually a picture I took at Ed Roberts' office in Cochrane, Georgia in 1995 when I interviewed him. Those, are, those were his in his doctor's office. And that's a whole other story, but very interesting. A, a little clip from War Games with an MSI there. Interesting that he had a computer like that in 1983. Some other examples, uh, this is from other older VCFs of you know, different microcomputers we're all aware of with the Apple II, uh, Processor Technology Soul, Commodore over there, North Star Horizon, IBM PC. It filled a room 50 feet by 30 feet. This is from that documentary. As well as like its so 18,000 tubes, it had tens of thousands of electrical components and half a million soldered joints. They called their creation ENIAC for Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, and it could perform 5,000 additions every second. Are people becoming obsolete? A giant electronic brain has started cogitating at the University of Pennsylvania. It's made of vacuum tubes, like your radio, and it can add up a column of figures. So a buzzword in the 50s that scared people to death the was automation. We're all going to lose our jobs. Right now, it's solving mathematical problems for the U.S. Army, but who knows? Someday a machine like this may check up on your income tax. But within a year, the name Univac would be on the lips of millions of Americans thanks to a brilliant public relations move by Remington Rand. Good evening, everyone. This is Walter Cronkite speaking to you from CBS Television Election Headquarters here in New York City. The big election night, 1952. The On this night, UNIVAC was catapulted from obscurity into national recognition 
with its television debut. Let's turn to that miracle of the modern age, the electronic brain Univac and uh, Charles Collingwood. This is the face of a Univac. A Univac is a fabulous electronic machine. So for a lot of people, this is the first time they ever saw a computer help us on television. election from the basis of the early returns as they come in. And you love Univac having those consoles is going to try right to there? predict the winner for us <laughs> just as early as we can possibly get the returns in. No, it's a real thing. Time, a now, I don't know if they did stuff with the lights or whatever, but that really is the, the main console of the Univac one. But things didn't go exactly as planned. The of you can see they put because Univac up on top. That, they did that for TV. Experiment. We think it's going to work. We don't know. We hope it'll work. At, any At 8 o'clock, Collingwood asked Univac to type out its prediction. Can you say something, Univac? <laughs> Can you tell us uh, what your prediction is now on the basis of the returns that we've had so far? Have you got a prediction for us, Univac? I don't know. I think that Univac is probably an honest machine, a good deal more honest than a lot of commentators who are working, and he doesn't think Why he's so coy, Univac. to tell us anything about yet. But we'll be back with him later. What Collingwood didn't know was that Univac did have something to say, and this was it. Just before CBS went on the air, Univac predicted Eisenhower would beat Stevenson by a landslide. The problem was, no one believed it. The machine turned out this answer that they didn't believe. This is Jay Presper Eckert, the were telling him that who worked on the ENIAC and then started the company. In we were Univac. telling them it's a landslide with only 5% of the vote. And they couldn't believe that you could predict the thing as accurately as we did, which was in a few percent, with only 5% of the vote. So everybody was thrown into total confusion. The, the Republic. <laughs> Excuse me. Live television, but the confusion would not last long. At the moment, <laughs> votes were now pouring in for Eisenhower. Even before all the polls closed, it was clear that Univac had been right all along. General Eisenhower was winning by the largest landslide in the nation's history. After midnight, CBS confessed to the public what had happened. As more votes came in. The odds came back, and it was obviously evident that we should have had nerve enough to believe the machine in the first place. It was right. We were wrong. Next year, we'll believe it. <laughs> okay, to talk about this next clip devices, is from 1968. We'll it's called the mother shot. of all demos. This is a uh, Douglas well, Engelbart the basically demonstrating what we all use today. I use three, point. and they're not all standard. This is pre a plain device called a mouse, too. a standard keyboard, and a special key set we have here. And we're going to go for a picture That's down the in the laboratory in Menlo Park and pipe it up. That'll show you, from another point of view, more about how that mouse works. Come in, Menlo Park. OK, there's Don Andrews' hand in Menlo Park. And in a second, we'll see the screen that he's working and the way the tracking spot moves in conjunction with movements of that mouse. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. It started that way, and we never did change it. What's the mail this morning? This promotional film made in the mid-70s to flaunt Xerox PARC research shows just how revolutionary the Alto was. It was friendly and intuitive. This is an experimental office system. It's in use now. It had the first GUI using a mouse to point to information on the screen. It was linked to other PCs by a system called Ethernet, the first computer network. And what you saw on the screen was precisely what you got on your laser printer. It was way ahead of its time. Crazy Eddie's greatest home computer sale ever, and Crazy Eddie's going home computer crazy with the absolute lowest prices anywhere on anything and everything at home computers. Atari, Texas Instruments, Commodore, even the new low price Timex Sinclair. Crazy Eddie's got them all, all the latest software too. Shop around, get the best prices you can find on home computers, then go to Crazy Eddie and he'll beat them. It's Crazy Eddie's greatest home computer sale ever, and Crazy Eddie's going home computer crazy. Crazy Eddie, his home computer sale prices are insane. <laughs> People really do crazy. So, anybody can guess what this is? Yeah? Again, like it or hate it, it's a major part of personal computing history. We live in this world.
Windows 95 makes it easier to deal with information. And it includes a lot of features to reach out from a single PC and communicate with other people, whether it's the Microsoft network or electronic mail or sharing files. A real theme of the PC is to become a great communications tool. And Windows 95 is a big step in that direction. Did anyone stand in line in August, whatever it was, and buy it? I stood in line. <laughs> the images you are about to see on the large screen will be generated by what's in that bag. Hello, I am Macintosh. It sure is great to get out of that now bag. Now this puts a tear in my eye. <laughs> Millions of people bought a Mac because it did things that no other computer could do. It really got people excited to, this is the personal computer like none other before. And for many years, Apple got away Phil Schiller. and forgot how to be different. The original Mac is an impossible He's got hair. But I think what, what we can do is, <laughs> is, one, benefit from the philosophy that was really the foundation for the original Macintosh. This product came to be because the exec staff said, stop. Let's focus on one thing, making the best personal computer, a computer that matches. So, of course, Windows 95 is 1995, and this is 1998. That wasn't a uh, beige box. Just imagine what's going to happen the first time somebody gets one of these home. I'm going to pull this thing out, I'm going to pick it up, and it's this gorgeous new shape. But the surface as well is totally seductive. I mean, it's a lovely thing to touch and to hold. This cool keyboard with translucent keycaps. The connectors are, are translucent. I'm going to pull out this, this exciting new mouse. It looks like the no best. other mouse you've ever it was seen the best. before. You turn it on and it comes <laughs> alive. It's always changing. It's well, always I'll use a mouse like that one day. And before you know it, in the first five minutes of opening the box, you're already in love with this thing. I'd like to play with one. I want to see one. I want to see what it'll do. I want to... So what, that's 18 years ago. And if did anyone watch the Apple announcements with the iPhone 7 and just the very, what is it, this week, right? Well, again, like it or love it, hate it or whatever. But you know, it's so funny because it's the same thing. <laughs> Phil Schiller announcing stuff and then um, Sir Ive or whatever, you know, going on about it, design and stuff. So still using the same formula. Come on. Okay, so uh, real quick here, uh, so we get some other clips, is um, try to keep this, you know, go, moving along. I'm going to just talk about something I call the three tiers of personal computing, more general computer history. So basically what I mean by this is uh, when personal computing, microcomputers were established, they established the first tier. And the first tier being desktop computing. So here are three, uh, you know, famous, very significant consumer computers. Next year will be the 40th anniversary of all three of these which is hi highly significant. There are personal computers before these, but arguably these three were the first ones that uh, normal people walked into a store, purchased, took home, took out of the box, and did something useful with, you know, arguably. So desktop computing, the first tier. So what happened with the second tier was, of course, uh, desktop computers weren't portable, typically. So the portable computer is what was the designation of the second tier. They were defined at first with what were called the luggables. So you had the, uh, the Osborne 1, 1981, and then followed by uh, the first Compaq, 1983. Um, of course, the Compaq is significant because not only was it you know, a portable IBM, it was the first truly 100% IBM compatible, which was very important back then. They had reverse engineered the BIOS, and that set the whole industry on a fire for clones. So luggables, the first portables, and then, then laptops were then, of course, we're all using those right now, is uh, ultimately define the second tier of uh, portables. Uh, these are both from the early mid 80s, so Toshiba and a Zenith. And you know, um, they haven't changed that much, arguably, right? Clamshell design, same basic, you know, other than with graphical user interfaces and pushing the keyboard back and trackpads and all. <coughs> laptops are laptops, just thinner and faster and so on. So now this is where it gets a little more interesting is a discussion of the third tier and what defines that. And the third tier had an interesting few missteps along the way. So you, know, you had your desktop computer, you had a computer you could take with you somewhere, it was portable, but wouldn't it be great if you could have a computer in your hand, in your pocket? That was the dream for a long time. Here's some early ones. So you have the HP 95LX, which was a true DOS handheld. It actually came with Lotus 1, 2, 3. 
Uh, then you have the Atari portfolio, and this is a, a Zeos. Anyone remember that company? It was pretty big for a little while. Um, get in my notes here. Okay. So these were all early DOS compatibles. Now they sold okay, respectfully, but you know, as far as these establishing themselves as a third tier, I'm saying that they failed. You know, that this this did not establish a third tier of personal computing. So Along into the mid-1990s, and Apple played a big part of this, you had what were called PDAs, or Personal Digital Assistants. So that's the Newton. These are all actually 1993. On the left, in the middle, is a Tandy uh, Zoomer, or ZPDA, with a Geos operating system. And that was an AT&T EO uh, communicator there, the most expensive one. So if you ask people about the future of handheld computing in the late or in 80s to the, the mid-90s, it was pin computing. There are magazines called pin computing and so on. There's no doubt pin computing was the future. We have to compute this way, but in the future, oh, that's the way we'll compute, right? And it'll be handwriting recognition and symbol recognition. It made sense, it was logical, and it really came to be true, mostly. But back to this, basically this was a failure, and some of the parts, reasons for this being a failure were, first off, these devices were slightly overhyped. Apple. Uh, paid a big price with that. A lot of R&D costs on that. They really you know, lost a lot of money. But um, too big, kind of overhyped, and cost too much you know, for what they did. And they were in no way, no way are we in a place where that can replace this, a laptop, which could even still, at this point, barely replace a desktop as your true computer. So what, interesting, what happened with the third tier is they kind of were, were uh, humbled and they kind of fell away for the most part. And you had this, this category come in called the, the organizer, which uh, utilized a lot of the design features of like mini laptops, touch screens with a pen, that is. Um, I, I have a sharp wizard in the middle. Anybody else have one of these guys? And um, I like it, it's pretty neat. Um, but you know, it's an organizer, I'll explain more in a minute, versus a true computer. So these did okay, but it was really that device that Palm Pilot, that's what changed everything. And the things that it got right was, it was small, it was cheap, it only did a few things, but it did them well. And it, so, you know, it's called a personal information manager. We all, we all have that built into our primary computing device nowadays, right? That you take for granted. And apps. Huh? And Yes, and then, yeah, ultimately you had apps too. And, and again, in some of these guys, you had spreadsheet capability and some other stuff. Uh, note taking, yep. Uh, especially the Palm. Grew, grew out to an ecosystem like that. So if you had asked anybody in the late 90s, you know, hey, you like your palm? Oh, I love it. But what's the one thing you, you, would, you would add to it? Oh, man, if it just had a phone, that'd be great. That'd be the best thing in the world if I could just have a phone on it. And some people added phone capabilities and so on. So you had this other category that started rising up and they were called smartphones. Here's some examples. Some people argue that the 1987 Simon there, I think it's 87, yeah, which was co-developed by Bell South and, and uh, IBM, that that's the first smartphone. In my opinion, it's not. It's the first, uh, it's the first organizer phone. It had touch screen, it had those PIM functionalities, but and again, in my opinion, I kind of designate a smartphone as it has to have internet capabilities. We all, that's what we all expect nowadays, right? So that means a web browser and email for getting anything else. So really, from what I can tell, that bottom left is the very first smartphone. It's the Nokia 9000 communicator from 1996. It had an email client, it had a web browser. It was mostly only sold and supported in Europe. So you didn't see these in the United States at all, if very little. So upper right is a Trio 180 from 2002. Um, generally speaking, this is what I consider the first smartphone in the United States. And yes, I'm being US centric. <laughs> Sorry, in my look here. Um, Anyway, and then obviously people recognize the BlackBerry. This, this came out a year later, this particular model, which is kind of where BlackBerry really started to explode, you know, with the wheel on the side. And, um, and so these were smartphones, but uh, I don't consider these the true first smartphones, and I'll explain why. So uh, upper left, 2007, the iPhone. That is the first true smartphone. This established the true third tier of personal computing. Why do I say that? Well, you, you, a lot of people forget this, but if you go look on video and Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone, hyping it up, making anything else, one thing he, he said was that was built on OS X. 
So iOS, it was called the iPhone OS back then, was OS X was its foundation. So what that had that no other smartphone had was a true desktop quality email client and a true desktop quality web browser, Safari. No other phone had that. So that established the first true third tier, and then a year later, the, the Google G1 here, the Android phone, its competitor, which basically this is what we all live with for the most part, these two platforms, right? iOS and Android. Does anyone remember the Google phone? I should have brought mine. I have these two. They're fun to break out. So established the three, three tiers of personal computing, the desktop, the laptop, and the smartphone. This is 2007, 2008, right? But then, uh, and I'm skipping over, there's lots of history here, right, that I'm jumping over. I'm kind of doing the highlights, but something interesting happened. And uh, 2010, the iPad is introduced. Yes, plenty of other tablets existed before the iPad, but again, uh, I don't think it just makes me a total sellout Apple fanboy to say that that changed everything about tablets. There's an Android device, and this is the world we live in, right? Is uh, Whether you have an Android device or an iPad, that changed things with multi-touch and pinching and zooming and everything else. So what I, when I first started, thinking about this concepts of three tiers and blah, blah, blah. You know, is this an extension of the third tier? At first, I was, is this a fourth tier? But ultimately, I decided it's an extension of the third tier. And what it did is it revised the three tiers. So I would bet you that the large majority of all of us sitting in this room, if not at this show, we all own all of these three things. Um, you have a, and I, I'm going to put it this way, it's slightly different. You have a laptop computer, you have a smartphone, and you have what I call a middle device. Uh, this is my laptop, a Mac. This is my smartphone, an iPhone. Yep, I like Apple. But believe it or not, my iPad, it didn't suit me just right. And my wife has an iPad. I have a Google Chromebook because I like the laptop form factor, but it folds around and then I can kind of use it as a tablet and it's touch screen and all that. And it, it serves me for what I care about using a middle device. But do you have an agreement? Most everybody has these three devices. So isn't that crazy? We all own at least three computers. When I remember my household, we had one computer up until 2004, the whole house. Okay, so now we're going to move into uh, some more fun movie clips. Let's see if you recognize some of these. Not a more fiendish disputant than the great hyperlobic omnicognate Newton Wrangler of Ciceronicus 12. The great omnicognate Newton Wrangler could talk all four legs of an Arcturan Megadonkey. And only I could persuade it to go for a walk afterwards. Then what is the problem? There is no problem. I speak of none but the computer that is to come after me. I think this is getting needlessly messianic. <laughs> a computer whose merest operational parameters I am not worthy to calculate, but which it will be my destiny Eventually, to design. Now look, can we get on and ask the question? Oh, all right. No great computer. The task we have designed you to perform is this. We want you to tell us the answer. The answer? The answer to what? Life, the universe, everything. Tricky. <laughs> That's the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that was okay, made for up. the BBC I know, I know television in 1981. I got it. This I'll is from the movie out. Desk Set, 1957. Like he does drive a specially built 1954 Pontiac. He borrowed the money he got. Made this is a Hollywood computer. You can, if you can't tell, the lights, and you'll hear some sounds and stuff. Oh my God! Animation sees me. Always, I love those. I don't know. I don't know. Calm down, you know you have to tell me. I, I can't fix it unless I know the secret. I don't know what I did. I don't know. It's your machine, not mine. Is this thing supposed to be smoldering? Don't shoot. Don't touch that machine. No, 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 no. <laughs> Stop crying. Crying won't help it just because you made a stupid mistake. Stupid? Yes, or, or asinine if you prefer. There's nothing wrong between me and Emmerich. Ever since I got here, you've done nothing but try to sabotage me. You all hate me. I've been forced to work in an atmosphere of hatred and suspicion. It's all you're doing. You did it. You did it. And you're just as bad as they are. I don't know what I did to the machine. That's why I don't care. 
about women in the workplace, really, right? Would this have something to do with it? Yes, yes, thanks. I just put a little piece of wire. How about this? Oh, that's fine. I hope he can't fix it. What's that? No, that's uh, the Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. Peace. It's wonderful. I don't think so. I'm not sure. So if you recognize it, yell it out. Let, do anybody recognize this? Great movie. You can watch it on the internet. <laughs> Oh my God. Yes, Colossus, the Forbin project, 1970. Dr. Forbin, a missile has just been launched. It is heading towards the Cyan CBS oil complex. This is the US government and the, and the Soviets talking to each other because their computers are now talking to each other and taking over. <laughs> Mr. President. Yes. Хранитель ответил. Guardian has retaliated. Retaliated. Yes, Mr. President. A missile has been launched. Target Henderson Air Force Base, Henderson, Texas. Mr. President, we have both missiles on the radar screen. But I get the both of you. Foreman, tell Colossus. Supreme, can you intercept on command? Charlie, tell Colossus. Yes, Mr. President. I know, but it may be it may be too late, sir. Get the Texas governor. Foreman. Garden does not respond. That, the two that, machines are working together. Together. Attention. No. Use anti-missile missile to intercept Soviet missile. Acknowledge message. And so the the uh, Colossus, the American computer, keeps saying just. Uh, restore link. Connect me back to Guardian, the Soviet computer, or we're going to launch. What are you waiting for? Restore them. Hurry. Peterson. Everybody might know what this is. We're in. <laughs> It thinks I'm Falcon. Hello. Mistakes. Yes, they do. How can I talk? It's not a real voice. Uh, this box just interprets signals from the computer and turns them into sound. Shall we play a game? Oh. <laughs> I think it missed them. Yeah, weird, isn't it? Yeah. So, 1983, uh, war so. games. Just suppose <laughs> I were to show you a way to manufacture a wall that would do the same job, but be only one inch thick. <laughs> would that be worth something to you, eh? <laughs> You're joking. Well, perhaps a professor could use your computer. Please. Computer? <laughs> Computer? <laughs> Hello, computer. <laughs> Just use the keyboard. The keyboard. How quaint. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've never seen no Mac interface like that. <laughs> <laughs> His keyboard skills are amazing. Transparent aluminum? That's the ticket, lady.
But it was the great question, the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. Yes, but what actually is it? Well, <laughs> just everything. You know, everything. <laughs> exactly. You have to know what the question actually is in order to know what the answer means. Geeko, right? Garbage in, garbage out. All right, well, that's it. I kept the time pretty low. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Did you go to your first slide again? <clears throat> My first slide? Yeah, where you had your webpage. And oh, sure. It's um, classiccomputing.com. <laughs> All right, I was worried I might go over, but that's not bad. 40, 46 minutes. So, all right, thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining me.